Good day chaps. So today's video is carrying on from our video on the Malkara and the FV-4010 British Heavy Missile Destroyers and has some very rare and special content with material that people have been seeking for years and never found. It's the Orange William Missile, a British rival to Malkara that theoretically was ahead of its time but in reality simply drove some of its users a bit mad. This video will look at how and why the missile came to be, the various launching platforms, and the difficulties experienced in just trying to get it to work. The project began back in 1953 with a proposal from the Ministry of Supply for a multi-purpose guided weapon that would be both an anti-tank and an anti-air missile, with a long range and using a joystick control. Now this didn't go anywhere, being fairly quickly dropped as just too complex. In order to design a missile able to hit a MiG, yet also be steered into a tank, and be usable by both trained army operators and merchant seamen, was just deemed impractical. It was then decided to split the missile into two roles. One half would be passed over to Shorten Harland in Belfast. This missile, the surface-to-air aspect, would be given the name Green Light as its rainbow code and in turn, Green Light would go on to become Sea Cat, Tiger Cat and Hellcat, and would bear resemblance to the other missiles in this topic. The other weapon, dubbed Project 6, would go over to Fairy Aviation's Weapons Division, along with an acronym soup of other government departments, and go on to become the subject of today's video, Orange William. This weapon was to be a Hesh-based anti-tank guided missile, developed in the UK at the same time as the UK was working on Malkara, with an in-service date envisioned for around 1962. And yet, as we shall see, the issues and challenges were just too great for the time, in both scope and the health and welfare of those involved. But why would the UK go to all this trouble if we already had one super heavy missile in development? Well, the key to that came down to range and roll. Malkara would have a range of some 2,000 yards as originally planned, and this later got up to around 3,500 yards. Orange William, however, would have a range of no less than 6,000 yards split between two vehicles, the rear launcher and the forward controller, with a separation of 4,000 yards between the first stage and the controller target distance of 2,000 yards in the second stage allowing the launch vehicle to no longer require any line of sight, which in the early 1950s was quite some feat. This system will not only be able to support armoured formations in the field, but offer tactical opportunities and fire support where nothing else could. Now these days it's all too easy to take this stuff for granted, in an age where we have computers in our phones and can build guided missiles just a foot long. But during Orange Williams' time frame, even small computers could be up to 8 tons in weight. Moving mechanical parts were built from iron and rocket motors looked about the same size as a medium weight hippopotamus. These missiles in turn would each have their own dedicated launch platforms. One would be the FV-4010 heavy missile launcher, which we covered before. This was designed from the beginning to mount Malkara, but also later on to Orange William missile particularly once they decided to alter some of the command methods to make Orange William so it should be more or less the same size as the other missile, give or take a few inches. They then proceeded to develop other mounts for the missiles as well, to suit the various roles it might find itself in, including a dedicated launch platform on the FV-420 series called the FV-426, while others were to be built on Comet, Ferret and even Land Rovers. So how does this weapon work? The missile itself was very similar in looks to the Malkara. Both have a Hesh warhead and a simplified fuse with around 35 pounds of plastic explosive. And both initially even used the same motor systems. But Orange William was a little longer at 83 inches or 2.1 meters compared to Malkara's 74 inches or 1.9 meters in length. In fact, from a distance, both missiles are visually very similar the key difference being the shape of the lower body and the rear tail fins, with Orange Williams being noticeably angled back, and on a close inspection, 
Orange William had the infrared trackers on each of the four corners of the hull. O.W. was also some 50 pounds or 22 kilograms heavier than Malkara at a chunky 250 pounds in weight, with the warhead alone weighing more than many complete missile setups do today. What the army wanted from all this was a missile that could be fired from a long distance and without the line of sight to the target. This was some years before systems like laser guidance were viable, and while wire guidance was initially considered, along with radar guidance, these were dropped due to the complexity, or in the latter case, its susceptibility to being jammed. And so they went for an infrared guidance system with wing flares of visual tracking. The missile would be fired from its launcher in an arcing trajectory, initially set at plus 10 degrees elevation, but later adjusted to just plus 5 degrees. And with a traverse originally set at 60 degrees, reduced to 30 degrees of traverse. The location between the launcher and the control vehicle had to have been pre-plotted and kept updated by encrypted radio, so that both vehicles knew each other's location despite no visual contact, as there was no GPS back then. Once airborne, the weapon would fly along a pre-programmed flight path towards a secondary vehicle that would act as the final command and control point. Originally, this was planned to be a Centurion gun tank, but due to the poor under-armour visibility, and the fact that a 40-ton tank tends to stick out a bit, they changed this into a modified ferret-armoured car. The ferret would have three crew, a driver, and two men in a turret sitting back-to-back, -back, the tracker and the aimer. The first, the tracker, would locate a target, for example a nice plump Soviet tank, and he would call the missile strike in. His job was to locate the target and keep it locked, but be situationally aware of where the missile was and where the target would be in a 3D mental space, including the estimation of where the tank would be relative to the missile's flight ahead of the present. The second crewman, the aimer, would be sitting behind him, facing towards the vehicle's rear. He would have an alarm to indicate that the missile had been launched and was now heading directly towards his position. He would then use a modified V-Sight system and begin to optically track the missile heading towards his position. And now came the tricky part. Once the missile was spotted, the aimer had to adjust his V-shaped targeting plate to align with the missile's flight, indicated by the flares on either side, giving an indication of distance as the missile grew in the targeting reticule. Once at a suitable distance, he would gather the missile up by taking over the missile's guidance system as the missile passed overhead and begin to redirect it into the target being tracked by the first crewman. Now, if that sounds fiddly, I'm about to say it only gets worse. The aimer, now in control of the missile, had a specially designed optical system that would allow him to view both the tracked target behind him with one eye and the incoming missile with another. As the missile passed overhead, this mirror system would swivel 180 degrees to adjust the missile view from a back view to a front view. Meanwhile, for a second or so, the missile would switch to autopilot while directly overhead to prevent any unfortunate twitches of the joystick sending it into the ferret. Now, the aimer, still facing backwards, was looking through a mirror system facing forwards towards the target and would need to recollect the missile in his sights and align it with the tracker's view. This needed to be done in around 1.5 seconds, by which point the missile was already 500 meters away. And from here, it could be guided into the target tank, where the Hesh warhead would, in theory, do the rest. When one has to consider that they originally wanted just one crewman to do this, you can imagine the difficulty of the task. Not to mention, at this time, there was a noticeable shifting time delay between the command input and the flight change that would vary depending on the distance between the missile and the controller, and then factor in that all of this would be in the middle of a war, with days of no sleep, and often surrounded by artillery and other fixtures of war going off, led to some problems. In fact, the whole system was so complex and difficult to master, that they had to bring in a specially appointed medical and psychology team to help the poor testing crews who were in some cases left mentally incapable for short periods.
with descriptions recorded such as erratic behaviour, vomiting and mild psychosis. Needless to say, this was and remained the biggest hurdle for the team to overcome. As to what vehicles were to be used, while well, most of those that could fire the Malkara were repurposed in one way or another to fire Orange William, and split into three categories. Heavy launchers with up to 20 or more missiles, medium vehicles with 4 to 8 missiles, and light platforms with 1 to 4 missiles. This would have a further doctrinal split with those operating in armoured formations and another lot to be air portable. The former would in theory replace the heavy tank in war, such as the Conqueror, while the latter was to operate in limited or periphery wars to fill in for the light and medium tanks until such vehicles could arrive. The Ministry of Supply had also decided that if they could get this new missile, there really was very little point in having Malkara itself, as in theory the new one did everything Malkara could do and more. Yet there were those who raised concerns over its weight, cost and whether it would even work, and so the British government placed an initial order for 150 Malkaras to be used as training missiles for Orange William, and also to keep the Australians happy as having to lay off jobs and contracts right in the middle of their elections would have been seen as a bad PR move. The FV-4010 heavy tank destroyer would have been the prime heavy platform that we covered previously, but this vehicle was very hard to move quickly and therefore attention was invested heavily into the medium and light rolls. In fact, in some notes it's recorded they didn't even want the big heavy 4010 at all for Orange William due to its lack of tactical flexibility. But the Treasury, who had invested a chunk of money, basically told them, they will use it, we've paid for it, and it's been tested, so get on with it. Meanwhile, the first of the two medium launchers was the FV-426. Now this is a most elusive of vehicles, and it has escaped some of the best researchers for many years, occasionally appearing in footnotes or text, but I was somewhat lucky in finding a collection of models in the archives and those were the Orange William vehicles. The FV-426 was to have been based on the FV-420 series, itself a short-lived precursor to the famous FV-430 series still in service today, and is recorded as reaching a full-size mock-up stage in 1959. Yet, so far I've been unable to find any photos of that one, just the model and text. And so with that, I passed it to my talented 3D artist, Al Sal, along with the FV-420 plans and images, and this is the vehicle as presented to the Ministry. The FV-426 would have operated alongside armoured formations in a support role, firing its missiles at the heaviest Soviet tanks. The model is very similar to the FV-420 base unit. The noticeable differences are the recessed cheeks are missing, with just an overall flat sloped face, and smoke launchers on the corner while the wider windows of that prototype were replaced with a shorter service window type. Although, it has been fairly pointed out to me that it looks more like it was designed by the Mechanicus than the FVRDE. Unlike some of the other proposals, it did not have a butterfly hatch system, and they went with a missile that would be built inside the hull and attached to a launch arm, which would then extend outside of the hull and be fired up at an angle towards the control vehicle. Each vehicle would have seven missiles stored inside it, either Orange William or Malkara, although one report has up to 15 missiles, but reduced due to an unworkable space. Inside the hull, the body and wings were kept separate and attached before firing. For the other details, we have to turn to the FV-420 base vehicle. The armour, for example, was 14mm thick at the most, and between 10 and 6mm elsewhere. A weight of 13 tonnes, and powered by a Rolls-Royce B-Series engine and a TN-21 gearbox. The fate of the FV-426 mock-up is unknown, however the FV-420 family, as was previously mentioned, cancelled and replaced by the FV-430 series, which would have been adapted instead. The second vehicle is, in my opinion, even rarer and was for many years on my checklist of super rare projects to find. It sparked my curiosity and so I spent the next eight years or so looking for this particular vehicle. The machine itself is a chop-shop job of a comet with an armoured box on top. But other than this model image, there isn't too much. 
we can see that it used the butterfly hatch system, but this one is hinged left to right, as opposed to forward and back, but otherwise appears to reload in a similar fashion, and the reverse arm can actually be seen inside the hull. The rest of the vehicle is as a standard Comet, with an armoured cab extending back about as far as the turret did. However, unlike the FV426, this vehicle was recorded to fill the role of a training vehicle and would mount both types of missile, but would not, it appears, have been part of the armoured formations. And finally, one more vehicle that appears in this list, and for similar reasons, is the Orange William and Malkara launcher on the FV400 family. Now this is a small series of carriers rather than true APCs, which came before the 420 series. Shorter and stubbier than its descendants, the FV401 or Cambridge carriers is otherwise known. This rig was used to test Malkara and possibly Orange William, as several missiles are recorded as having been fired, albeit without the guidance system. And this is one such system built for testing the missiles, having a launcher arm mounted on the back. The vehicle was later found abandoned on Lulworth Rangers, where it was taken back to Bovington, who did what any top museum would do upon finding a surviving vehicle from an almost forgotten project, by chopping it all off and stuffing it to one side. What's left of the hull can be found in the VCC today. As to the light vehicles, they can go on to another video as so we'd simply run out of time. But they include things like the Land Rover launchers, and of course the famous Hornet. But as for the missile project, well what happened to it? Fairies were plain stuck. The primary problem was, and would remain, the separation distance required while trying to make a missile that was not too big to handle or too costly to ever produce. Although by this stage, each missile would already cost more than the ferret vehicle alone. There were also problems with budget constraints from the ever penny-pinching and thoroughly inept politicians, who constantly bombarded the team with inspections and inquiries about progress but refused to provide a reasonable budget to employ the specialist staff required. Fairy was also consistent in their demands to get a simulator system up, but were denied, and had to borrow one from Pi, which was embarrassing, while the use of small remote control planes was suggested to get some practice on. Other issues included getting a smoke-free rocket, and they switched over to the woodpecker motors, while the guidance department tinkered with Q-band radar and other ideas. By 1959, 30 missiles were reported as ready, and several were undergoing trials. However, the targeting system was still problematic, and Malkara was now able to reach out to nearly half the same distance and was in production. On top of this, the Hesh warheads were proving somewhat hit and miss, with Hesh being problematic at certain angles, and newer armors were in development that would render it nearly useless. And then finally, there was Vickers who was sneaking around behind everyone's back, which, to be fair, was a Vickers thing, and they were working on their own anti-tank missiles in the form of the Type 897 and Type 891 missiles, which would become the Vigilant Anti-Tank Guided Missiles with a heat warhead. Now this missile was quite a surprise for all involved, as nobody seemed to know that Vickers were doing this until it appeared in a copy of the Flight magazine and a newspaper article which rang all the alarm bells as it was already going to trials. Various ministers and project leads tried to assure those involved they would not have to worry about this, and it was quite unlikely the new missile would find any buyers. But the writing was on the wall. Heat-based missiles were the future, as adopted by all other current NATO members, and this one was cheap and could be carried by a single soldier. On the 22nd of September 1959, Orange William was cancelled and all material was sent to be scrapped, and today, very little exists or remains of this large project. Following the closure of the project, Ferry would be paid a stipend of cash for their effort, but would use the lessons learned and a new set of specifications to go on and create the Swingfire missile, which was one of the finest anti-tank missiles of the Cold War period. While Makara would serve on for a few more years yet, but never be fired in anger. In the next video, we'll look at the final part of the Malkara missile story, its role and use as well as the joint light vehicles that would use it, such as the Humber Hornet and the air droppable vehicles. A huge thanks to Elzal and his excellent 3D artwork. And until next time, guys, toodle pip.